Welcome everyone. I'm Dr. Keith Morin. You're watching Medicine with Dr. Morin. Today I'm in one of my offices where I see patients. One of the things I get asked on nearly a weekly basis by patients who sit across the table here from me is, Dr. Morin, how can I get the most out of my visit with you? Today we're going to answer that question. That's the focus of this presentation. Let's get started. I've made this comprehensive presentation on what patients should do before seeing a new doctor. The more that you're prepared for the visit, the more you will get out of it. The visit will also run more smoothly for your doctor. Medicine can be difficult for physicians. Your doctor may be on call and inundated with hospital responsibilities, other office or other medical responsibilities while you are there. On the slide is a comprehensive checklist of items to consider before the visit. There's nine items in total here. This list is obviously the most relevant when you're seeing a new doctor for the first time. First of all, you need to know the location of where you'll be meeting the doctor. Many doctors, like myself, see patients in multiple different locations. Be sure you know where you're meeting the doctor. You also need to know what items you need to bring. Your health card and medication list are obvious ones, but there are many other things potentially on the list. There may be special instructions for the appointment, especially if you're having a test done at the same time as a consultation. It is important that you know or bring information about medication history as well as your medication list. I can't stress that enough. You should be able to talk fluently about your general medical history as well as the history of your current complaint. Your current complaint is very important. It's something you should think about before your visit. This is the main reason why you're going to see the doctor. You should write down specific questions that you might have. It can be quite helpful if a friend or family member comes with you to the appointment. It's also very helpful to bring along a pen and note paper to summarize the visit. Next, I will go over each point on the checklist, which we had on the last slide, one by one. The first I want to talk about is the location. It's important that you know the exact location where you're going to be seeing the doctor. You need to make sure you give yourself lots of time to get there in the event that you're traveling from quite a distance or if there's rush hour traffic or even construction. Life happens when you come to see the doctor. You need to adjust your time for that. You of course can enter the address of the doctor in the internet search engine so that you can see typically how long it might take to get there and make sure that you plan accordingly. This also gives you the opportunity to familiarize yourself with the route that you will be taking. There's nothing worse than showing up really late and potentially having your appointment rescheduled or just feeling rushed through the appointment. Remember, this is your health. It should be important to you. Yes, I know that doctors, even myself, can run late sometimes but some interruptions and emergencies are unpredictable. The problem is if the first couple of patients are late in the morning, then the doctor will be running late the whole day. This is always frustrating for me and for all of my patients who follow patients who are tardy. It's something for you to keep in mind. It is respectful. You should also have a telephone number of the doctor in the event that you need to reschedule the appointment, or if you have questions about the appointment. Please be sure that you have the appointment date and time correct in your calendar. Some doctor's offices like mine will have an arrival time for new patients, which can be 15 minutes ahead of the actual appointment time. When we book patients in for endoscopic procedures such as colonoscopy or upper GI tract endoscopy, the arrival time in fact is an hour early because it takes time for someone to get ready before we actually do the procedure. 
15 minutes in an office visit is used to check you into the office and complete necessary paperwork. All new patients and anybody returning whom I have not seen for some time will fill out a questionnaire prior to the visit. The next slide has got a list of items that you should consider bringing to the appointment. Your health insurance card, your medication list, details of your medical history, which I will review in a minute. There may be other important data such as blood pressure and pulse readings if you've got high blood pressure, for example. If you have diabetes, a list of your blood glucose readings is very appropriate to bring along. If you use a self-tracking activity device like a Fitbit or Apple Watch, download your data and summarize the findings before the visit. The same would go for your insulin uh, glucose monitor. You should also bring the results of any relevant investigations that your doctor may not have. Sometimes there are tests done right before the appointment and there's not enough time for the doctor to get the results. So if you have access to those, bring those along to the appointment. Some of my patients want to show me a picture of a lesion or other abnormality on their body. So remembering to bring in your camera or cell phone to show me what you want to show is very important. It can also be helpful to create a reminder before leaving for the appointment to make sure that you bring everything that you need on this list. Alternatively, you can always take a picture of your diabetic readings or blood pressure readings with your phone and even do the same with your medication list so that if you forget your pages with the data, you can always show me the information directly on your cell phone. Special instructions. If you're having a test done as well as a consultation, there may be test preparation instructions that you need to follow. Some of my patients are seen at the time of tests, such as endoscopic evaluation with upper endoscopy or colonoscopy, not to mention stress testing or echocardiography, and they will have a consultation done at the same time. This one-stop shopping is great for patients, particularly those that travel a long way to come and see me. You should review any instructions for your tests ahead of time to ensure that you've done your preparation correctly. The instructions for the test are there to make sure that the test goes smoothly and that the results are as accurate as possible. I use patient information sheets and videos just like this one here on my channel so the patients know all the specifics about their upcoming tests. The next slide has the medical history. This is important and listed on the slide for the appointment. Physicians always ask questions about all of these different categories here. Patients often forget to tell me things during a visit. They can be nervous or perhaps there's a lot of information to tell me and they simply forget to say something. Often they'll remember something as they're walking out of my office and let my staff know. So being prepared is important. It's a good idea for you to have a document on your computer or phone that lists all of your medical history with all of these different categories. Your family physician or primary care provider may be able to give you a copy of a medical profile, which we call the cumulative patient profile. It will go into detail each one of these categories. It's based upon the data that they've collected on you over the years. So when they put that data together, they summarize it on this sheet. Many patients though, who are referred to me, don't come in with these sheets because they're not accessible to the emergency physician or the family doctor may not have made a sheet that they've sent to me as part of the referral package. Many patients who refer to me think that I have access to all their medical history, which is simply not the case. So ultimately it can be worthwhile to create your own document. The document should have all the different categories on as listed here. Remember, this becomes very indispensable if you end up in the emergency department, especially if you're out of town or even out of the country. After all, we all sometimes need to go to the emergency room. The triage nurse will ask you about your health and medications, not just the reason why you're there. It's helpful for the emergency room doctor who will see you to know your general health as one of your medical problems can be relevant to the reason why you've presented. 
In fact, 10 or 20 percent of hospitalizations occur because of drug side effects. So the medication list is key. Often, it can take some time to get a hold of your pharmacy and square away what medications you really are taking. Sometimes the pharmacy isn't completely sure either. One of the nice things is, is that an increasing number of patients I see in my office do bring a document which they've created themselves outlining their entire medical history with these different categories. It's always helpful for me to see this. It makes the visit run much more smoothly and I know that I've gotten all the data that I need. It also tells me that this patient is very engaged about their health. The list here on the slide shows the history of your present illness, meaning the reason why you're coming in to see the doctor. You should think about this and do this every time you're going to see a doctor, even if it's your regular family doctor. You should always lead off with this concern. Remember, it's never a good idea at the end of a visit with a doctor to mention the chest pain that's been concerning you or the lump that you want to show your doctor. It bears repeating. Remember to always mention the most important concern to you. Now, as far as that concern goes, it's important to know a little bit more about your symptoms. So you might want to consider how long you've had them, what they feel like, what makes them better or worse, or whether there's a relationship to any medication or change in diet or exercise that might have something to do with it. The next point on the slide is past medical illnesses. They can be listed chronologically by date. Often looking at your medication list will tell you a lot about what active medical problems you have. So if you're on thyroid medication, for example, or blood pressure medication, you can write down that you've got an underactive thyroid or if you've got high blood pressure. A list of past surgeries can also be relevant to your problem. As mentioned before, a written list of your medications is needed. A list of allergies or even side effects to medication are important. Doctors really don't want to give you the same medication that you've had before, which gave you bothersome side effects. I've seen that happen too many times and it's not worthwhile taking the same medicine all over again. Family history is the next category. This can be relevant as your first degree relatives or parents could have the same problem that you're currently presenting with. Your social history helps us with the diagnosis of your complaint, as well as deciding when you can go back to your job. For example, your employment may have exposure to things like dust or mold, for example. Often musculoskeletal injuries are a reflection of repetitive injury that occurs at work. That might be the cause of your chest or abdominal pain even. Habits are important. Caffeine, alcohol, or recreational drug consumption should be documented. Be honest about those habits. It will serve you well. Sleep can be relevant. Ideally, seven or eight hours of sleep each night is optimal for good health and memory. Your exercise routine, if you have one, is helpful to document. One of the most important questions that I ask patients are what sorts of physical activities that they can do. It gives me a good idea of what we call your functional capacity. Knowing that someone can go for a walk of say two kilometers or for 20 minutes without stopping gives me a pretty good idea of how well your lungs and heart can tolerate exercise. It gives us a barometer of what you can do now so that we can make comparisons down the road if I see you again in a year, two years, five years. Remember to document any other symptoms that you might have, test results, for example, when you had your last CT scan, stress test, cardiac echo, they can be helpful as well. Medication list. When it comes to the medication list, it's important to write down the name of the medicine, the amount that you take, and its frequency. Having a photo of the list on your cell phone or the list written on a small piece of paper can be helpful. Put it in your wallet or purse. Many patients will rip off the medication list from their blister pack if you have medications that are put in blister packs. Remember that it's very difficult for people to remember the exact names of the medications, how to say them, and the exact amount and frequency. Often we adjust the frequency or the amounts, so we need to know the exact amount of each medication that you take. 
The medication list is going to be the first question that you're going to get asked in the emergency department after the reason why you're presenting there. Some of my patients will write down the reason for each medication on their list, which reminds them why they're taking their medicine. It also brings up the issue is if that problem is well controlled, they may bring up the issue as to whether the medication could be reduced or even withdrawn. I've written two examples on the slide here of how to document medications. The examples are aspirin, 81 milligrams once a day. And the other one is metoprolol, 50 milligrams twice a day. The next slide is on questions. You should write down any questions or concerns that you or your family may have about your medical condition before the appointment. Make sure that you get your questions answered. It's important that you write these down and ask them so that you can feel that you got what you needed out of your visit. If there's something you do not understand, even something that you think is really small, you need to ask for clarification. If you do not understand the approach your doctors are taking to a problem, you must please speak up. It gives the doctor a chance to explain the rationale which you may not understand. Your doctor should not mind being questioned about these things. Personally, I don't. It gives me a chance to explain things from my perspective. Often that's something that patients don't always realize. Sometimes it brings up other questions and it allows me more insight into my patient's concerns. This sort of thing builds a team approach to your health and that's, to be honest, what you really want. I always learn a lot when patients ask me questions and as I mentioned, it sometimes does change the way we manage things. I like to see people speak up and get engaged with respect to their healthcare problems. Please do not be afraid to ask about other treatment options. I would rather patients speak up and question me rather than not say anything and be critical of my approach later. If your doctor uses medical jargon, which we do not mean to, jargon that you do not understand, please ask for clarification. It's very important to be honest with your doctor. You may not like to admit how much you smoke or how much you drink or whether you stop taking your medication because of side effects or even cost, but your doctor needs to know these answers because it does improve the quality of your care and there may be a lot of other options. Family member or friend. I always encourage other people to be present during the visit, such as a family member or friend. Often when I know that they've got a family member with them, I'll go out into the waiting room and grab that person and bring them into the office. It does improve the quality of visits for my patient as well as for myself. I often say that two heads are better than one. It saves me time only needing to explain my impression of the visit and my plan once. Some of my elderly patients have difficulty with their memory, and this is where it's helpful to have a second person. Even with young people with good memories, sometimes there's a lot to say, and to be honest, it can be overwhelming, and the information may not be processed well by my patient. When my patient does not remember everything, I have said that there is at least one other person that was with them in the examining room that can help them after the visit to fill in details that they may not recall. I understand that patients are often not relaxed when they come to see the doctor. They might be scared and thus the retention of information may not be optimal. At least three to five times a week, even though I try hard to give a clear, brief explanation of my impression and plan, by the time my patient gets to my reception staff desk, 10 seconds later, they may have forgotten what tests they need to have done, what medication changes I just said, and what the plan is. The next point is taking notes. Writing down helpful points during the visit is something that you can reference later when you're at home. Write down what the doctor's impression of your problem is and the plan. This might include additional tests that are needed, medication changes, and what the follow-up is. There may be things that your doctor may ask you to do. For example, you might need to document your blood pressure or pulse if you're having symptoms. 
And when you do have symptoms, there may be some things that you need to look for. You need to know what's going on during the symptoms, whether there's any associated symptoms and how they feel to you. This can be helpful to your doctor. The doctor may give you videos or even information sheets to refer to after the visit to help you. Remember, at the end of the visit, it can be helpful for you and your family member to review what was said and make additional notes if needed. Some of my patients do that out in the parking lot. Remember, the relationship with your doctor is one of the most important that you have. Advanced preparation, as I have discussed, will help you use your own time and your doctor's time much more efficiently and effectively. Preparing for your visit helps you become a partner in your health care and makes you a better advocate for your health and well-being. Thank you for watching my presentation on how to prepare for your doctor's visit. I hope you learned a lot from my presentation. Let me know in the comments section what particular things you took away from the video. If you really enjoyed it, please click like. I'm Dr. Keith Morin. This has been Medicine with Dr. Morin. Get healthy and stay healthy.